All right, I guess we'll get started. Uh, so today we're very happy to have Robert Brandenburger visiting from McGill. Uh, he's an expert on basically all things in the universe, uh, from cosmic strings to sort of ended inflation dynamics and alternatives to inflation. Uh, he'll be around for the rest of the day today and part of the day tomorrow. Uh, so drop by the visitor office if you'd like to talk to him. And we'll be going out for dinner tonight, so let me know if you'd like to join. And he's going to be talking about uh, string theory, the swamp brand, and the implications this has for cosmology and dark energy, inflation and dark energy. So. Right. Okay. so first of all, thanks for the invitation to visit and to speak. And uh, thanks to the audience for two things. First of all, for braving the cold weather and coming here. And secondly, for braving this title, which is not exactly the kind of title of a talk that you usually get here. Now, I am neither a cosmologist like you are, nor a string theorist. I'm a pencil and paper uh, person who claims to be a cosmologist. So caveats, and I will try to give a talk, and I'm uh, quite aware that it's a provocative title, and I'm also quite aware that there are people here who um, do not have such a high opinion of superstring theory. Uh, superstring theory was oversold when it was uh, first popularized in the 1980s. And when something is oversold, then there's very often a backlash. However, I will try to persuade you that the backlash is not justified. In particular, I will try to argue that if we want to really understand, understand both early and late time cosmology, we will need superstring theory or else something that replaces superstring theory. <coughs> so this is a message I want to get across. Now, I have uh, quite a list of things. I have a lengthy introduction, which is sort of the motivation. And then I have to tell you a couple of key things about string theory. Now, I'm not a string theorist, so don't be afraid. This is not going to be very difficult uh, because I couldn't make it difficult. And then I will ask the question, what kind of an early universe scenario could come out of string theory? And I'll give you one possibility, which is called string gas cosmology. And afterwards, I will return to the question, if you really want inflation or quintessence to come out of string theory, can you do that? And there are certain obstacles to, the, to that, swampland conjectures. And uh, then I'll conclude. So that's the menu for this afternoon. So let me start with the observation. So you, or else people in the astronomy department, are providing us theorists with lots of data. So you all know what this data is. We quantify the data, the angular power spectrum, microwave anisotropy. So it's lots of data. And we would like to find an explanation for that. And in standard Big Bang cosmology, there is no explanation for all of this nice data. And so we have to go beyond standard cosmology and beyond standard physics in order to have a chance to explain this data. Now, a quick question. Who is a graduate student? Yeah? OK. So for the graduate students, I've lied in two places here. And you have to find out where I have lied and come up to me afterwards, tell me where I have lied. Now, in the days of modern technology, you'd be tempted to take your cell phones and look at cosmology textbooks and to try to find out where I lied. You will not find the answer because all the books say exactly what I just said. So you have to take a little bit on. But anyway, let's accept for now that you have to go beyond standard cosmology and standard physics in order to explain all of this nice data. Well, so we have a current paradigm of early universe of cosmology, of cosmology. And this current paradigm involves two periods of accelerated expansion. One of them is something that happened in the very early universe, which is inflation. And the other is something that we are getting into now, which is an accelerated phase driven by dark energy. Now, according to our models, 
both phases are realized by means of scalar matter fields. Scalar matter fields. So these are not fields which are contained in the standard model of particle physics, except for the Higgs field. The Higgs field can give neither primordial inflation nor dark energy. Now, scalar fields, you don't have to be afraid of scalar fields because scalar fields are extremely simple. And you can get anything you want with scalar fields. Anything you want if you have no constraints on what kind of scalar field. And so you learn absolutely nothing if you just model what you want with a scalar field. So if you want to do something with scalar fields, you better ask, where does this scalar field come from? So in particular, scalar fields seem to be quite tightly constrained by superstring theory. And this is going to be one of the main topics of my lecture. Isn't there something called Higgs inflation? Then you have to add something beyond standard physics. So you have to add a coupling, an extra coupling of this Higgs field to gravity. So anyway, let's go back 10 years before inflation. 10 years before inflation. There were two beautiful papers, one by Peebles and you, and the other one by Zeldovich and Zunyayev. And this is a plot which I took from this paper of Zeldovich and Zunyayev, 1970. So this is time. This is space, co-moving spatial distance. And um, this is the gene's length. The role of the gene's length is that fluctuations on length scales above the gene's length are frozen in. Fluctuations on length scales below the gene's length, smaller than the gene's length, oscillate. So what these authors argued is that let us assume that we have a roughly scale invariant spectrum of primordial fluctuations on super Hubble scales, super horizon scales. They are standing wave fluctuations. They will enter the, the gene's length and they will start to oscillate. Different modes have a different number of oscillations before they hit the time of recombination, which is probed by the microwave background. This mode you catch at maximal amplitude, maximal gravitational redshift. This mode you catch at minimal amplitude, and so on. So what was argued 10 years before inflation is that if you give me a roughly scale invariant spectrum of primordial fluctuations on, soup, on scales larger than its seeds length, then you will automatically get acoustic oscillations in the angular power spectrum of the CMB. So you will automatically get these kind of features. So this analysis was 10 years before inflation. Now, this is only half of the diagram in the paper by Zeldovich and Zunyayev. There's a lower half. And in the lower half, they plotted the matter power spectrum as a function of wave number. And these oscillations are also manifest in the matter power spectrum. So this is the second half of this plot, matter power spectrum as a function of wave number, and these oscillations, the BAO. So acoustic oscillations in the microwave background and BAO were predicted 10 years before inflation. So this is what I say here. <clears throat> now, where does that leave inflation? So the, answer, the question which was not addressed in these early papers is, how does one obtain such a spectrum of super horizon, super standard Big Bang horizon, primordial fluctuations? And inflationary cosmology is the first such scenario, is the first scenario based on causal physics which yields such a spectrum. And at each conference where I speak and where Slava Mukhanov is present, I will always give Slava Mukhanov a bottle of wine in recognition of the calculations which he did, which not only gave you the scale advance of the spectrum, but the slight red tilt. Let's see. Inflation is not the only scenario which yields such a spectrum. So we cannot say that the CMB, that the acoustic oscillations in the CMB prove inflation. They just show that certain conditions for primordial fluctuations are satisfied. So now I want to address the question, how 
does one obtain such a spectrum? Does one need, really need inflation or are there alternatives? So what are the criteria? And one important thing to keep in mind is the difference between Hubble radius and horizon. So the horizon is the forward light cone of a point on the initial surface, for example, the Big Bang surface. So the horizon tells you the region of causal contact between early times and today. The Hubble radius is a local concept. It is the inverse of the expansion rate. And the Hubble radius plays a role in terms of the dynamics of fluctuations. Fluctuations with a wavelength smaller than the Hubble radius oscillate. Fluctuations with a wavelength larger than the Hubble radius are frozen in. So the Hubble radius is relevant to the fluctuations. The horizon is relevant for causality. So in standard Big Bang cosmology, the Hubble radius is equal to the horizon, and therefore there's a horizon problem. You can't explain the isotopy of the microwave background because the horizon is the Hubble radius. And in any theory which can explain the horizon problem, the horizon has to be much bigger than the Hubble radius. So you better not call the Hubble radius horizon. Otherwise, you confuse everyone, including yourself. So now if you want to produce fluctuations by a causal mechanism, then the wavelength of the fluctuations, when you produce them, better be smaller than the Hubble radius. Because you can't move around stuff on short time scales if the wavelength is larger than the Hubble radius. So you see, the <coughs> quite. Can you explain why you want to move things on a scale that's smaller than the Hubble scale? Because I want to create them using a demon which is pulled apart, which only lives Hubble time. Um, this was my choice, and you are, you have, are completely justified in challenging me. No, it's very important to point out. <laughs> thanks a lot for asking this question. So I'm imagining a mechanism which is acting on a short time scale, smaller than the Hubble radius, which is creating the perturbations. That's an hidden. Uh, that's an assumption. So that's not an assumption for here, but that's an assumption for the second criterion. So in order, so uh, my criteria for a successful early universe cosmology, that's this. And this is independent of your question. So simply in order to, ex to explain the isotopy of the microwave background, you need this to be true. But if you can imagine a structure formation mechanism which slowly works on a time scale much larger than a Hubble radius, you don't need this criterion. But I will assume this criterion. And if you assume that fluctuations start out as vacuum fluctuations, then you need to have a mechanism which turns the vacuum fluctuations into squeezed vacuum fluctuations that look classical. That's the squeezing. And finally, the mechanism which you, which you develop has to produce a roughly scaling band spectrum of cultural perturbations. So these are the four criteria for successful early universe scenario. And inflation indeed is a scenario in which these four criteria is realized. And this I sketch in this space-time diagram, time and space. This is a period of inflation, exponential expansion of space. And if space expands exponentially, the causal horizon expands exponentially, but the Hubble radius is constant. So this exponential increase in space causes the horizon to be exponentially larger than the Hubble radius. Now if we trace back the length scale of fluctuations, which we observe today, then in this period of exponential expansion of space, the wavelength expands exponentially. And so if this period is long enough, everything that we see today emerges from uh, sub-Hubble scales. <clears throat> if we start with quantum fluctuations, then quantum fluctuations get squeezed on super-Hubble scales. If you want to know why, you can ask me later. And finally, the time translation invariance of this phase of exponential expansion. So the energy density is constant. So if you imagine a demon stirring the soup, 
the soup producing waves, the amplitude of the waves when they cross the Hubble radius will be the same at all times. And that's a mechanism that generates the scaling variance of the spectrum. So in inflation, all of these four criteria are realized. But it's not the only one. If we consider a bouncing universe, so imagine time, scale factor, a contracting phase, some new physics giving a bounce, the standard Big Bang phase of expansion. If we now draw the space-time sketch, time and space, this is a bounce point. Then I plot, here I use co-moving coordinates in which the wavelength of fluctuations is constant. If I plot the Hubble radius, the Hubble radius is linearly increasing in the expanding phase and it's linearly decreasing in the contracting phase. So time runs from minus infinity to infinity. The horizon is infinite. Hubble radius is finite. So no horizon problem. Fluctuations emerge on sub-Hubble scales. There's squeezing that takes place. And it turns out that if this phase of contraction is a mirror inverse of the phase of expansion, that then vacuum fluctuations in this early phase develop into a scaling invariant spectrum of fluctuations at late times. So there are various versions of bouncing cosmology. You have a symmetric bounce. And then you also have an asymmetric bounce in which you have very slow contraction. This is called the ekpyrotic scenario. And in the ekpyrotic scenario, then you need to have a <clears throat> different way of getting the scale invariant spectrum of cosmological perturbations. So Roger Penrose has this new idea of a conformal universe. So does this also give you a scale invariant um, spectrum? I do not think so, but let's talk about that afterwards. But another, ver another <clears throat> scenario, and that's a scenario that's going to be relevant for some of the later parts of my talk, is the emergent universe, where I assume that at early times there's a quasi-static phase, a hot quantum gravity gas, and then there's a phase transition to the standard Big Bang phase of expansion. So quasi-static early phase, time runs from minus infinity to infinity, phase transition here, standard Big Bang expansion. So this is a space-time sketch. Early phase, quasi-static. Late phase, standard Big Bang expansion. This is uh, space. This is time. This is the Hubble radius. This is the length scale of cosmological perturbations. Here I use physical length scale. So horizon infinite. There's no horizon problem. Fluctuations emerge on sub Hubble scales. There is squeezing going on. And uh, why is the plasma decreasing in the, in the first phase? Uh, so the horizon, the hub, this is not the horizon. I'm sorry, the Hubble radius. Hubble. Because the, this is static. So h is equal to 0. So Hubble radius is infinite. Then the universe starts to expand. The Hubble radius comes crashing down. <clears throat> so if you want to model that in general relativity, you need violations of the usual energy conditions here. OK. So the message so far is that inflation is not the only early universe scenario which can give you fluctuations consistent with current observations. Now, which of these paradigms which I presented arises from beyond standard model physics? OK, and since I want to be provocative, I'm going to make a particular argument here. So I'm going to say that beyond the standard model physics, it should be a theory which unifies all four forces of nature. And since we know that three of them have to be treated quantum mechanically, the fourth has to be treated quantum mechanically as well, the fourth being gravity. So therefore, it needs to be a quantum theory of all four forces, which describes them in a unified way. And the only candidate I know is superstring theory. So I'll rephrase this question and in this form. Which paradigm of early universe cosmology arises from superstring theory? 
OK, preview. Uh, <clears throat> if you start with superstring theory and you look at the theory at low energies, the effect of field theory, which describes low energy physics, then if there's a scalar field in this low energy field theory, then these, they are constraints. And first of all, the effect of field theory is only valid if you look at field ranges smaller than order one in Planck units. And the potential of this scalar field obeys these constraints. So the slope of the potential has to be sufficiently large. This is a, C1 is order one in Planck units. Or else, if you are near a maximum or saddle point of this potential, the curvature has to be sufficiently large. So these are these swampland conjectures, which are quite rigorously discussed recently. And I should mention conjectures. And I'll come back to the conjectures at late time. Axiom-like fields emerge quite easily in string theory. And they obey this constraint. But do they obey the range constraint? Yes, they do. So how do you seem to think of the second? The range constraint is pretty clear because you're probing high energy scales in your field. Yeah. Can I postpone yeah, this question? So. Can I, I, I'm going to answer your question, okay. but I first have to introduce some of the key notions of string theory. OK, so what does that imply? Large field inflation is inconsistent, because in large field inflation, the scalar field rolls more than M Planck. Slow roll inflation violates this condition. So slow roll inflation is in the swamp. There are no local and global de Sitter minima. So inflation doesn't naturally fit into string theory. Now you see, Komun Waffa is a person who's popularized these swampland uh, conjectures recently over the last few years. But this is absolutely nothing new. Because back in prehistoric times, before the invention of the archive, uh, Kuhn, Waff, and myself were, were sort of trying to see whether inflation comes out of string theory. And we concluded, no, it doesn't naturally come out of string theory. Instead, we get something better. And this something better is uh, something that I'm going to explain. And uh, I, I want to be provocative when I use the word better. Now, dark energy cannot be a cosmological constant. Now, today, it is still possible, given current observations, it is still possible that quintessence can explain dark energy. It's not yet ruled out by observations. What is quintessence? Excuse me? What's quintessence? Quintessence is an accelerated phase that describes our current universe given by a scalar field, which is the fifth essence, is that new scalar field. So that's the definition of quintessence. So, uh, and here I have some, uh, some data. Uh, future data, for example, Euclid, will much more tightly constrain quintessence. And I'll illustrate this using these plots. So this is the equation of state parameter of the scalar field that gives us dark energy. So W equals minus 1. That's the equation of state of a cosmological constant. This is redshift. And current constraints see no deviation from a cosmological constant. And these are the constraints at the one sigma level and the two sigma level. And um, this string swampland conjectures, they have a free parameter in it, which is order one. And we would like to pin down this order one parameter. This order one parameter, that's the lambda in these plots. So let's take Kuhn Waffa's favorite value for lambda is square root of 3, which is bigger than 1. Let's look at lambda equals 0 0.9, which is a bit uh, more conservative bound. So you see that lambda equals 0 0.9 today is not ruled out at a uh, 3 sigma level. So at a 3 sigma level of confidence, we don't, since we don't see deviations from a cosmological concept, we cannot rule out quintessence. However, with given Euclid data, and also given a, 
uh, chime VAO data, we will be able to have three sigma, actually this is, uh, this should be exchanged, three sigma limits at this level. So if we, in the future, after Euclid, see no deviations in the equation of state parameter from that of a cosmological constant, then we will be able to exclude lambdas down to 0 0.4. So if string theorists can, can, can firm up their ignorance of this order one parameter and they can say that it's bigger than one, and observations tell us that there are no deviations from that of a cosmological constant, we will have ruled out quintessence as a source of dark energy. OK, so I hope that this is what observations will tell us. Because <clears throat> this will mean that neither a cosmological constant nor a quintessence can explain dark energy. And we really need radical new ideas to explain dark energy. And you see here, I don't see, I don't say we may need radically new ideas to explain dark energy. We need radically new ideas to explain dark energy. Because none of our current models address the fact that the cosmological constant or whatever dark energy is, is becoming important right now. The coincidence problem is a huge fine-tuning problem for all current models. And therefore, we definitely need radically new ideas. And data that you will be collecting in the next five years will show us that quintessence is ruled out. OK, so this is where I'll be heading. And so now I will come back to this question I will ask which early universe scenario naturally emerges from superstring theory. So this theory should explain the problems of standard big bang cosmology, and it should also produce a good spectrum of cosmological perturbations. Because these are the requirements. So now I have to move on to the, the second part of my talk, which is a few elements of string theory. Now be aware, I'm not a string theorist. So it's going to be simple. And in fact, I will need a prop. And the prop is here in my pocket. And it is a string, you see? And I need a second prop, which is on the table, which is space. OK, this is space. This is strings. OK. So I'll make the assumption that space is toroidal. All dimensions of the space are compact. Now, if the fundamental theory is string theory as opposed to point particle theory, then we have string stage states, which you don't have if the theory is based on point particles. So strings don't only have center of mass motion on space, but they can also wind the space. So this is a mode, a string winding space, which you don't have in point particle theories. And you see that strings can do something to this compact space, which you could never get with point particles. OK. Now, strings also have other things which point particles don't have. Oscillatory modes, many oscillatory modes, an exponential hierarchy of oscillatory modes. So, now, the energy of the center of mass motion modes is proportional to 1 over r, where r is the radius of a torus. The energy of winding modes is proportional to an integer times r. The energy of oscillatory modes is independent of r. So if string theory, as opposed to point particle theories, is a basis of uh, physics, then there are new degrees of freedom, and there are new symmetries. Let's exchange large space with small space. And when we make this transformation, r goes to 1 over r, let's interchange these quantum numbers, n and m. Then you see you have a symmetry of the spectrum of states. And this symmetry is also a symmetry of string interactions. And string theorists want this symmetry to be a symmetry of 
non-perturbative string theory. So a theory based on strings has new degrees of freedom and new symmetries. And if you try to describe this string theory using field theory, you will have lost the symmetries and lost the new degrees of freedom. OK, so now, what happens if you take a gas of strings, which contains both the winding modes and the oscillatory modes? Well, as was realized already in the late 1960s, if you look at the temperature of a gas of strings as a function of the size of a box, then the temperature will rise as the box size decreases up to a maximal temperature, which is called the Hagedorn temperature. And then it will level, the temperature will level off. And once the radius goes below 1 in string units, the temperature will start to drop down in complete consistency with this duality. So a box of strings, if you compress it, the temperature will never diverge to infinity. Gas of point particles, temperature diverges to infinity. So if you assume that string theory describes fundamental physics, then there's obviously going to be huge impacts for early universe cosmology. And if you try to describe that with a field theory, you will miss all of these. OK, so let's imagine now uh, different scenarios for how the radius could change as a function of time. The radius could start out here and slowly increase. And then the temperature would start low, the temperature would increase, level off, and decrease. Temperature bounce. What could also happen is that this looks like a metastable long-lived state. So the universe could hover here for a long, long time and eventually fall off. So you seem to have two different possibilities for a temperature time plot of a stringy old universe. You either have a temperature bounce or you have this emergent phase. And it is this green trajectory which I will be following later on. Now, for those of you who are comfortable with elementary quantum mechanics, I can make another argument. So in quantum mechanics, position operator, the measuring stick with which we measure distances, is given by the Fourier transform of momentum. But in string theory, we have something which is dual to momentum, namely winding. So in string theory, there are, there's a dual position operator, which is defined as a Fourier transform with respect to winding. There's an absolute symmetry between the two. So there's a symmetry between these two position operators. They have different periodicities. So for large R, there's a very large period for x and a very small period for x tilde. Conversely, for very small r, small period of x, large period for x tilde. OK. Now, for those of you who are experimentalists, let's imagine that you want to build your measuring stick. Measuring stick, you want to build it. Now, we have limited energy to build it. So if r is large, we will build the stick using the momentum modes, which are light. Momentum modes. So our measuring stick will be the x stick. But if the universe contracts and r becomes small, then this measuring stick will disintegrate because it's been built with the degrees of freedom which become heavy. And a new measuring stick will appear, which is equivalent to this, but which is built with the winding modes. OK? And if we hover near the self-dual point, then neither measuring stick is appropriate. In fact, if we want to measure position, we'll, there will be two position operators which are equally important. And if you want a field theory description of that, it will have to be a field theory description which lives in twice the number of spatial dimensions. So usual effect of field theory based on supergravity will break down in the early universe if string theory is the correct description 
of nature. OK, now I realize that this has been recorded. And it will be then posted. <laughs> and I'm not, uh, the comments I'm making are quite provocative. And uh, some people will not agree with them. So be aware, you, I'm uh, trying to persuade you of something. OK, good. Now, if, so if you want to construct a physical length operator, it will be proportional to r for large r. It will be proportional to 1 over r for small r. And if the radius of space, this mathematical idealized radius of space, goes from very large to very small, the physical length operator will bounce. Looks like a bouncing cosmology. OK. So this is one of the crucial aspects about, about string theory. Now, string theory has a slight problem. It is only consistent in 10 space-time dimensions. But you see, point particle field theories are consistent in any space-time dimension. So string theory is better at least select one. But you have six dimensions that we don't see. They have to be compactified. And the sizes of the extra dimensions, they are degrees of freedom, which look like scalar fields from our four-dimensional world. They are called Keller moduli. And if you imagine that if you take two of the extra dimensions and you visualize them as a torus, then you have the angle of the torus which is a complex structure modulus, it is, also, it is also dynamical. So potentially, these new scalar field degrees of freedom could play an important role in our universe cosmology. That's a hope and a question you can ask. But you have to realize that the typical range of these fields is given by the, is of the order of the string scale. There's not, you cannot naturally make it large. Well, I think the size of these um, uh, projected dimension just the Planck's Planck length. Because the basic quantity is the string scale. You can show that the, partic the preferred radius of an extra dimension is a string length and not the Planck length. And I will justify that in a while. OK, now string theory has other degrees of freedom. There are other kind of objects called brains. And the brain positions in the extra dimensions also yield scalar fields. But their range is also of the order of a string scale. And then these brains carry fluxes, and this gives rise to axions. But the typical field range is also of the string scale. OK, so these are moduli. These moduli have to be stabilized, because otherwise we would have time-dependent coupling constants. And this time-dependent coupling constants we don't see today. So now, if you forget about the strings, if you only keep the particle degrees of freedom, you have a lot of trouble stabilizing these moduli. But if you keep the strings, it is natural that the size moduli are fixed. Because the winding modes will prevent the spatial dimensions to expand. And if you try to compress the, spa the spatial dimensions, the momentum modes will become too heavy. So there's an optimal radius for the extra dimensions, which is given by the string scale. So momentum modes, this is like a centrifugal area? That's a, no, it's a center of mass motion. It's not, it has nothing to do with orbital motion. You remember that when I had the energy of a center of mass around the torus, the energy is quantized in units of 1 over r. Why does the center of mass motion carry if you contract or not? Quant that's quantum mechanics. Point particle motion on a compact space. The energy states are quantized in units of 1 over r. OK. So this, if you keep the stringy degrees of freedom present, then you find that the size moduli are um, stabilized at the string scale. And you can show that the degree of freedom 
that describes an angle of a torus is also stabilized in an expanding background. The variable that describes the angle just has a harmonic oscillator equation state with a damping term, and the damping term comes from the expansion of all four dimensions. And if you want the details, then these are the references. Well, string theory also contains a scalar field called the dilaton, and that has to be stabilized by hand using some mechanism that I don't want to get into. And this same mechanism breaks supersymmetry. So string theory predicts high scale supersymmetry breaking, not low scale supersymmetry breaking. So the fact that we don't see supersymmetry at the LHC is in complete support of string theory. If we had seen supersymmetry at the LHC, we would have a huge hierarchy problem to explain. OK. So now, we could hope that one of the moduli fields would naturally yield inflation. But I will try to argue that another cosmological scenario for the early universe naturally emerges from string theory. And this is string gas cosmology. OK. So the idea is to make use of the new symmetries and new degrees of freedom which string theory provides and be as conservative as possible. So we will assume that there's some background space time. Matter is a gas of fundamental strings. And I'll consider weakly coupled string theory. So I'm going to make use of these string oscillatory modes, which leads you to the maximal temperature. And the string winding modes, which leads us to this temperature radius plot. And I will be assuming that the universe starts out here or we follow the description of the universe starting from a point where we are here, then this looks like a long-lived state. The larger the entropy of the universe is, the larger the range of this plateau. So we will hover for a long time here, and eventually we roll off. So this is the assumption uh, that string gas cosmology makes. The radius of, the, of our four-dimensional universe is approximately constant at early times. And then there's a phase transition to the standard Big Bang phase of expansion. And this phase transition is triggered by two winding strings crossing and cutting themselves up into two loops. And loops behave like radiation, whereas this doesn't behave like radiation. So this process is the phase transition that takes you from this early static phase to standard Big Bang radiation dominated phase. Now, strings are two dimensional space time objects, and in more than four space time dimensions, there's zero intersection probability. And so this process only allows three dimensions of space to expand, not more. Okay? So we have a natural explanation for why there are three, exactly three large extra dimensions and why the other spatial dimensions are fixed at the swing scale. OK. So now, can we use this background cosmology and come up with a structure formation scenario? So I remind you of structure formation in inflationary cosmology. So this is the inflationary phase, standard Big Bang phase. This is the Hubble radius in inflation. This is the length scale of fluctuations. So in inflation, we have quantum vacuum perturbations. They exit the Hubble radius, become squeezed, and then enter the Hubble radius at late times. In this background cosmology, the space-time plot is this, time-space. This is the phase transition. This is a static phase. This is standard Big Bang phase of expansion. So this expanding phase is the same as this expanding phase, but the early phase is completely different. So this early phase is not a phase of quantum vacuum matter, like in inflation, but it's a phase of a hot string gas. 
So in this setup, if we want to imagine fluctuations originating, these are going to be thermal fluctuations of a gas of strings. OK. So now what we are going to do is we are going to take this thermal gas of strings. We are going to compute the matter fluctuations, the energy density fluctuations, the pressure fluctuations in this early phase. And we are going to use them to seed the cosmological perturbations, the density perturbations, and the gravitational waves. So this is our three-step procedure. We calculate the matter fluctuations in the static phase. We convert the matter fluctuations to metric fluctuations when they cross the Hubble radius, like we do for inflation. And then we evolve to the future, like we do in inflationary cosmology. And here are the results. So these are the cosmological perturbations the scalar metric fluctuations and uh, gravitational potential fluctuations. And these are the gravitational waves. And the gravitational waves are determined by the, the off-diagonal pressure perturbations, the Newtonian, the relativistic potential fluctuations are given by the energy density fluctuations. So we will take string theory. A thermal gas of strings, and we will compute these quantities in the early universe, and that will give us the quantities that we can compare with observations. Okay, so this is the logic of a calculation. So let's look first at the cosmological perturbations, the things that will give us microwave anisotropies. So density perturbations in a thermal state, they are given by the specific heat capacity, temperature, size of a box. No string theory. If you take a gas of strings, then the specific heat capacity has this scaling on R. It's the so-called holographic scaling, not R cubed, R square. And this is the dependence on the difference between the temperature when the fluctuation exits the Hubble radius and the Hagedorn temperature. So all, everything is here. Everything is here. Everything is here. Um, this is here. So you see, we, I'm now this is how we calculate the microwave anisotropies using this. Input energy density fluctuations, energy density fluctuations given by specific heat capacity, specific heat capacity given by this. This is a string input. You do the calculation. This is the final result. Shouldn't there be a symmetry between if you replace T with 1 over T? Because no, because in this setup, temperature never, the TH is a maximal temperature. In this conservative approach, there is, temperature is bounded from above. So, where, so where's the symmetry you were telling us about earlier? Where do you replace an NNM with the... That's it, spatial. R going 1 over R. Has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with temperature duality. OK, good. So all the constants are in this formula. And so this tells you the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations as a function of k. OK, k. Where does k appear here? No, no k. Scale invariant. The amplitude, it's fixed. It's fixed in terms of the temperature in the early phase, the Hagedorn temperature, Newton's gravitational constant, the string scale. OK. Now there's actually, so therefore, the power spectrum of cosmological co perturbations is scaling around like for inflation. Now, the temperature here is actually is a temperature when the scale k exits the Hubble radius. And this is slightly k dependent. So there's a very slight k dependence of the spectrum, and it gives you the red tilt like for inflation. OK, not good. No way to distinguish from inflation. So let's continue. We compute gravitational waves. They are given by off diagonal pressure perturbations, doom, doom, doom. Skein variant, but with a blue tilt. Different from inflation. So if you measure B mode polarization of the microwave background, you find a blue tilt, you will have falsified inflation, at least simple inflationary models. You have confirmed a prediction that was first made in the context of superstring theory. Well, if bicep had been correct, if bicep had been correct, this is a blue spectrum, not a red spectrum. 
So if bicep had been seen, this primordial gravitational waves, bicep would have falsified inflation and verified a prediction that was first made in the context of superstring theory. OK. But anyway, these predictions that we are making are not too far from what potentially, for what can potentially be observed. OK. What's your prediction for the relative applicants? It is given by something between about 10 to the minus 3. We have two free parameter, two consistency relations. One consistency relation tells us that the blue amplitude of the blue tilt of the gravitational waves is equal to the amplitude of the red tilt of the scalars. And the other one gives you r in terms of the tilt. OK. Good. Now, string gas cosmology doesn't ha is, has problems. It doesn't explain with extra inputs the size of the current universe. It doesn't explain without other inputs the flatness. These problems are absent if this early phase is embedded in a bouncing scenario. But if string gas cosmology were correct, but followed by a phase of inflation, the problems would be absent too. So in the last five minutes of this talk, I want to return to question, could inflation actually arise from string theory, maybe after this early phase? So can one of the moduli fields naturally yield inflation? Can one of the moduli fields yield dark energy? So now in the low energy limit of string theory should be described by, by an effective field theory. But not all effective field theories are consistent with string theory. So we have a huge landscape of field theories. You can have arbitrarily many fields. The potentials are, you can tune them whatever you want, so you have a huge landscape, landscape of field theories. Most of them are inconsistent with string theory. They are in the swamp land. That's a fancy word that has recently been invented. So field theories which are inconsistent with string theory, they are in the swamp. And there are little islands of effective field theories which are consistent with string theory, which poke out of the swamp. Little islands in the swamp land. So what are the conditions on these little islands? This is the first condition. The effective field theory it remains valid only for field intervals, intervals smaller than one in Planck units. And the reason for that is that once you roll for more than m Planck, then new string states become massless and have to be included in the low energy effective field theory. So the anyway, consequence is that large field inflation is in the swampland. Stable de Sitter is inconsistent with string theory. And here I will cheat. I will say that it is well known that Supergravity is inconsistent with de Sitter. There are famous theorems going back to Malassane and Nunez and Gibbons. And it is stringy effects that could provide for a lifting of the potential, but that can only yield metastable dynamical um, fixed point, dynamical solutions that can be described by scalar fields. But this fact already tells us that dark energy cannot be a cosmological constant. Is anything wrong with a stable Let's look at that. I'll get to that. So now these are the constraints on the shape of the scalar field effective potential. If you have a rolling scalar field, then this is a constraint that comes from string theory. If you have a metastable, uh, if, you have, if you sit at, the, at a local maximum, on a saddle point, this is a constraint. So that means that slow roll inflation is in the swampland, and you can have no metastable or saddle point inflationary solutions. But now you. Can you give some intuition about these conditions? Yes, that's the next. Okay. Okay. So intuition on the first. So assume a slowly rolling field. You see, it's rolling very slowly, which is why I used three L's here. <laughs> um, now, the argument in this paper is that if the scalar field rolls slowly but over a long distance, then 
new states will become massless and will lead to an entropy increase. But the entropy increase is bounded by the entropy that can fit into a apparent horizon. It's a Gibbons Hawking entropy. And this leads to this condition. So it's an entropy condition. So you see, I have a one here. I'm going to give you another argument later. Now, it, so that's an, the argument that will give rise, that explains this. The argument that gives rise to this is the weak gravity conjecture, which says that gravity is the weakest force. But if, you, if this is not satisfied, then there's a matter force which is weaker than gravity. So this is where this, this comes from. And you see, we would like more, a better explanation for that. I'm not satisfied. Scalar it's a scalar force. Scalar. It's a scalar force. OK, now, for this first condition here, I can give you another argument. And that applies to size moduli, to scalar fields which come from the radius of an extra dimension. And we can show the stringy effects lead you to a low energy effective potential, which is quadratic. And the field range is smaller than 1. So you automatically get this. And this is back the early work on string gas cosmology. OK. So. In this case, this condition is just equivalent to the small range. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. OK, so co constraints on dark energy. Dark energy cannot be a bare cosmological constant. Right now, quintessence is still OK. Mm -hmm. But it will be uh, testable better testable, better constrainable in the near future. But quintessence already now requires extreme fine tuning to get the coincidence. So I'm already uh, half a minute over time, so it's time to conclude. So, um, OK, so I hope to have argued that if you start with the assumption that superstring theory is the basic theory that describes microphysics, then you have to take into account the new degrees of freedom and the new symmetries that string theory has that point particle theories do not have. Duality symmetry, winding modes, oscillatory modes. Effective field theory based on supergravity will break down in the early universe. And inflation does not naturally emerge from string theory. I'm not saying that you can't force it in. You, I mean, from, I think string theory is rich enough that you can force it in. But we would not like to force the cosmology we think is right into the theory. We would like to step back and see, can we actually get something different, maybe more naturally? And I hope to have argued that something like string gas cosmology appears to emerge naturally from string theory. OK, dark energy cannot be a cosmological constant. And upcoming observations will provide stringent tests of quintessence as an explanation for dark energy. OK, so these conclusions number one. OK? And if you buy the idea that something like string gas cosmology gives you an alternative description of the early universe, there's conclusions two. And this alternative theory of the early universe can be an alternative to inflation for producing what we observe now. And it makes testable predictions for future observations with which it can be distinguished from inflation. And this is a characteristic spectrum. So thanks for paying attention. For, for example, if you take a um, D brain and you wrap it around a compact dimension many times, that's the way you can construct a quasi periodic potential. But you see the range, so the, the um, constant which gives you the period is smaller than the Planck scale. And so therefore, you can't use it for inflation. That's an old problem that was already uh, pointed out by Dine and uh, Seiberg. Uh, uh, 
and the weak gravity contraction reinforces that. That's been the saddle point, the saddle point argument. Okay, I have a quick question. So in the string gas, you're using classical perturbations. That's right. Ones, yes. Is there any chance that you can have some sort of belt violation test that you can look for? I don't know. But I think, I think there's work by Jérôme Martin and Vincent Venin about this a couple of years back. Okay. Any last questions? Okay, let's think forward again, and there will be cookies upstairs. <laughs>